Good morning and thank you everyone um, for attending. I know we're going to be spending some time together tomorrow, so I appreciate everybody who took the opportunity or, or took the um, time to come out and hear from um, the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. I know many of you know that um, the College Illinois program, which is the prepaid tuition program that's been in existence since the mid-90s created by the legislature um, has run into some funding issues in recent years and um, the student uh, the ISAC has done a very good job in trying to uh, to stem the the uh, difficulties that the fund is having but there is still um, a, a bit of unfunded liability and other challenges that lie ahead. So um, we thought we'd invite ISAC to come in and give us a presentation on where the program um, has come in recent years and then what challenges um, what challenges they foresee in the near future. So with that, I would like to call um, Eric Zarnikow, the Executive Director of the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, and Kent Custer, the Chief Investment Officer of the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. Um, they have presented us a handout that I believe you're going to be working from? Correct. So I'm Eric Zarnico. I'm the Executive Director of the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, and we appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk with you. Um, as noted, we do have a handout that we're going to take you through, and of course, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of our presentation. So on page two, it really lets you know what we plan to cover here today and wanted to note that most of the information we're going to cover today is has been publicly available in the College Illinois Annual Report, on the College Illinois website, and also in our annual budget submission. But I know that we have some newer members um, here today, and also I know the breadth of all that the General Assembly has to deal with uh, is enormous, so we wanted to take a few minutes and provide some historical context on how we got to where we are today. We're also trying to address the challenges that the plan faces early and proactively because we believe the challenges can be addressed with the help of our elected officials. If you turn to page three, it's our program overview. So once again, a little bit of history. The program was launched in 1998. It was signed into law by Gov then Governor Edgar and really had near unanimous bipartisan support in the General Assembly. And the prepaid tuition program, I want to distinguish it from uh, this is a 529 prepaid tuition program versus a 529 savings program. So in a prepaid tuition program, you, we actually allow participants to buy future tuitions of semester today at today's contract rates, which is different than a savings, 529 savings plan, which is more like a, a 401k plan. The plan is backed by the moral obligation of the state. It does have the same advantages of a 529 plan that provides some significant federal and both and state tax advantages. The d main difference is the 529 prepaid tuition plan reduces the market risk for participants compared to a savings plan. The plan is, has been entirely funded by contract purchases at this point, and the plan benefits, although they're tied to a public university or community college, they can actually be used at a private school il in Illinois or can be used out of state. To date, the program has paid out about $970 million in benefits for over 35,000 students, and we still have about 38,000 contracts outstanding. On page four, we have some quotes from some College of Illinois contract holders, and you know we did plan to have a College of Illinois contract holder testify today, but he had to go to a medical appointment. And, but he asked us to share his comments nevertheless with his experience with the plan. And what he told us, he ended up buying a plan in 2007 and that he debated about whether or not to buy a plan for his son because he thought that maybe they would have enough money just to go ahead and pay for college. But he ended up deciding to buy a plan just to be sure and not have to worry about it. Well, he ended up being diagnosed with cancer and his medical bills and other related costs were very significant. And what he told us is without College Illinois, he didn't think he would have been able to pay for college. And through his illness, he had the peace of mind of knowing that College Illinois was there and that the cost of tuition and mandatory fees were covered. 
And one of the things that he did tell us also is you don't realize how many costs there are when you go to college. There's a lot of costs that sort of people don't think about that really add up over time. And uh, for those of you who've paid for children to go to college or in that process, you know what we're talking about. I'd say also in my role at ISAC, I've been, you know, I travel the state and I meet different people at different times at different events. And I've met very, a lot of college Illinois contract holders have been very happy with the program and have told me that without this, their child wouldn't have been able to go to college, or if they did, that they would have come out with significant student loan debt. And I've also talked to a number of contract holders who still have contracts. Their beneficiaries are still in that stage where they're getting ready to go to college. If you turn to page five, I frequently get asked the question about, you know, what are the things that really impact College Illinois? What are the things that really make a difference? And these are really the three main levers that drive the program and drive the funded status of the program. So first is tuition and fee inflation. So if we see tuition and fee growth exceeding expert expectations, that's a negative for the plan from a funded status. If it's lower than expected, we get an actuarial benefit. Investment returns are an important element of driving the funded status of the program. So if investment returns exceed expectations, that's a benefit. If they're below expectations, that negatively impacts the funded status. And then contract sales, an appropriate level of contract pricing and sales are important to have a reliable investment, a reliable stream of money to be able to invest. If you turn to page six, mentioned that contract sales was a key driver of the program. And what this chart shows is annual contract sales based on our you know, fiscal year or the enrollment periods going back to the inception of the plan. And you can see that for the first 10 years or so of the program through 2007, 2008, we were selling in excess of 4,000 contracts a year. You might note in 2010 and 11, that dropped to about 1,000 contracts. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. 2011 and 12, enrollment was suspended. And then you can see what's happened the last five years, which I'm also going to focus on in a slide in, in just a few minutes. If you turn to page seven, I'm going to first talk about some challenges in fiscal year 2011 and 12. So we saw that the program was really challenged for about a decade with really hyperinflation of tuition and mandatory fees. So we, we had about a 10 year period in Illinois where tuition and mandatory fees increased by almost 10% a year. Now that was driven by a lot of things, um, including although well-intentioned truth and tuition studies show actually drove tuition and fees higher. There's issues with state appropriations. There's a whole number of reasons. And at the same time, the plan was also impacted by the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. You may recall the Great Recession when investment markets were significantly challenged. By the end of June 30th, 2009, the funded ratio of the plan had dropped below 68%. So there was a significant underfunding of the program at that point. In 2011, the prior management's investment choices were really met with a barrage of negative press that resulted in some temporary increased oversight in FY12. Uh, you saw earlier on the last slide that we did suspend contract sales for a year, and you've seen what's happened in that five, that five or six year period since we resumed contract sales, which I'm also gonna drill down a bit in just a minute. This, these challenges also led to a number of management and govern, governance oversight changes that I wanna highlight on the next slide on page eight. So in 2011 fiscal year, an entirely new commission board was appointed in July of 2011, appointed by Governor Quinn. The new commission also formed an investment committee of that commission as well as an audit committee. These were committees that ISAC did not have previously there was also a reappointment of an investment advisory panel. So as part of the statute for College Illinois, there's a seven person investment advisory panel and that panel was reconfigured or reappointed. Uh, they also got a new executive director. That's why I'm sitting here today. We got a new chief investment officer. Why, that's why Kent Custer is sitting here today. And once again, program enrollment was voluntarily suspended for FY12. On the next slide, there was also a number of program initiatives related to the investment portfolio. 
So we procured a new investment consultant, Callan Associates. We implemented a new investment policy and asset allocation, and we also put in place that we do annually review, at least annually, the investment policy and asset allocation. We also prohibited any sort of direct private equity investments. We also have put in place new procurement processes that have been codified into our administrative rules. And we've also implemented Public Act 98 uh, 1022, which relates to minority investment managers. And we currently have about 61% of our public market assets that are managed by minority or women-owned firms, and that represents about 30% of public market fees. If you turn to the next page, page 10, we also did a number of things on the marketing front. So we have a new program director who's focused exclusively really on managing the marketing of the program, and she joined ISAC in April of 2014. And over that time period, when you think about marketing, what is it intended to do? It's really intended to create interest in the program, that you have people who want to learn more and follow up, people that come to the website of the program to learn more. And since 2012, we've seen about a 44% increase in qualified leads that we receive and over 100% increase in website visits. So we think from the marketing side, we're getting interest in the program. We also, in 2014, restructured pricing of the contracts to improve affordability. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And we were able to do that because we were beginning to see some moderation in tuition inflation. And we saw that that improved contract sales for FY15 by about 48%. And at this point, from a contract pricing perspective, we have the lowest um, percentage above the current tuition since fiscal year 2003. So we think the contracts are priced appropriately and prudently. If you turn to the next page, page 11, I had mentioned that I was going to drill down more into what's happened with contract sales in some of the most recent uh, time periods and go a little bit more in depth. So once again, 2010-11, we sold about 1,000 contracts. That's when we had the negative press. We suspended voluntarily for 2011 and 12. And when we came out of that voluntary suspension in 2012-13, we sold just under 900 contracts. And we thought that was actually a reasonable first step, that we were getting back on track to be able to build contract sales. Sales for 13-14 uh, were a disappointment. We saw a significant drop in sales compared to the prior year. That was a time where you know there was a lot of publicity about the high cost of college, is it worth it or not. There was a lot of negative press about the economy in Illinois. That was the beginning of kind of the, the awareness of the fiscal crisis, particularly around pensions and pension reform. You may remember Squeezy the Pension Python was kind of the news at that time. So there was a lot more kind of general awareness of the public about some of the challenges that, that Illinois faces. Once again, for the 14-15 enrollment period, we did reduce contract pricing and address that. We saw it about a 48% increase in contract sales, admittedly off a pretty low base, but we felt that that was a trend that we could build upon. And then for FY 15-16, we were actually up in sales pretty significantly through January. And then as the budget delay wore on and the impacts on the universities were front page news every day, we saw contract sales just flatten off, and we ended up down for 15-16, and then that's really continued in the 16-17 time period. So if you turn to page 12, so you might ask, you know, what are some of the challenges that's facing the plan at this point around uh, contract sales? So once again, you know, F College of Illinois is a 529 prepaid tuition program. There, as you know, there are also 529 savings programs. So in Illinois, that's bright start and bright directions, but almost every state has 529 savings plans. And we've seen that some of the national trends seem to be favoring savings plans. They're growing faster. Um, now, more recently, the stock market has really done well since 2010. It's more than doubled in that time period. So. We feel like investors may feel like they have more control, and they're also maybe more familiar with a mutual fund-like structure similar to what they might see in a 401k plan. In addition, their commitment can be a small amount. They don't have to commit to buying a, at least a semester um, like they do in the prepaid tuition program. 
when we look on page 13, the next one, one of the headwinds around college savings and uh, College Illinois is just the whole college affordability challenge. So what you see on this chart is looking at the total cost of attendance for a public university as a percentage of the mean household income. So you can see, you know, when the plan started in 1998, for a public university in Illinois, the total cost of attendance was less than 20% of the median family income. If you fast forward to today, the total cost of attendance for one year is closer to 40% of the median family income. So there's really an affordability challenge also in paying for college today. And you'll see that as demonstrated some more on the next page on page 14. This is just isolating tuition costs and what's happened in current dollars. And you can see that there's been significant growth in the cost of uh, tuition as well when you look at Illinois in total and then also compared to the national averages as well. In addition, on, on page 15, I mentioned previously that there was negative media headwinds that we saw in that 2011-2012 time period. So particularly Chicago's, or Crane Chicago business has been critical of the program, and they tend to write on the program each year. That tends to be negative. At times, the publication has called for the program to be closed. When there was the media issues in 2011, they called for the program to be closed. And you know, I, one of the things I've met, you know, with with contract holders as I've traveled around the state of Illinois, who panicked in 2011 and they canceled their contract. They were concerned about the underfunding. They questioned whether the state of Illinois would be behind the, their moral obligation or not. Um, so there were people that canceled. And at least the ones I've met tell me that was a huge mistake, that they had college taken care of, and now either their kids are getting ready to go to college and they have a huge gap in their college savings for their children, um, or they're just now not covered for college. So one of the things we want to make sure is that as we appropriately manage the plan and address the challenges today, that we don't panic contract holders, that we keep them in their seats because, you know, they've planned for college and we want to make sure that they, uh, that th those plans work out for them. On page t um, 16, for the past couple years at least, and maybe longer, we've seen some pretty significant headwinds in Illinois higher education more generally, and particularly for the public schools, universities, and community colleges. As you all know, there was a delay in funding and ultimately reduced funding for schools. That really led to staff layoffs, the elimination of programs. We've seen faculty attrition with faculty leaving to go from public universities to private schools or leaving the state. We've seen enrollment declines, and I would suspect that that will continue this fall based on the FAFSA volumes that we see. And really, day after day of negative headlines ultimately have a long-term impact on colleges and students. We hear of counselors who advise students to go out of state because they're concerned about the reliability of higher education in Illinois. So the state's long-term fiscal, fiscal issues have really eroded confidence in the state. They've eroded confidence in the future financial stability of the colleges, and they've eroded the confidence and credibility of the moral obligation. So although I believe the moral obligation is a real thing and will be there, it's no longer seen as a valuable as it was when you think about it from a general public perspective. And the next really two slides just have a number of those headlines that you've seen related to the headwinds of higher related to higher education in Illinois. So I'm not gonna read those headlines to you. I'm sure that um, you're familiar with many of these and I know that you all have been living through them as well. So at this point, for the next section, I'm gonna turn it over to Kent Custer. As mentioned, Kent is our Chief Investment Officer, and you heard earlier that he joined uh, College Illinois and ISAC late in 2011. So Kent. Thanks, Eric. I'll be starting on slide 19. Uh, the purpose of the actuarial analysis is to evaluate whether the program has enough money to meet future obligations. Results are highly dependent on certain assumptions that, while reasonable, may, not, may be quite different than the reality that comes to pass. Key assumptions for the prepaid tuition program are expected tuition inflation and investment earnings. Thus, we have to be careful 
when we're looking at the actuarial analysis, um, to, to think of them as um, broad perspective and not as specific point in t uh, pinpoint, excuse me, as a forecast with pinpoint accuracy. So that qualification, let's look at the analysis and trends from the actual reports provided by the program's actuary, GRS. Overall, we, while we remain underfunded, the picture is much improved from recent years. So we, we kind of summarize uh, the current situation on slide 19, where we have, uh, as of June 30th, 2016, about 1.3 billion in assets and about a billion dollars of, excuse me, 1.3 billion dollars of liabilities and a billion dollars of assets, equating to an unfunded liability of 264 million. And generally, actuarial results are presented in present value terms, meaning that future cash flows are discounted to the present using the earnings rate. So the unfunded liability of 264 million reflects future funding needs, in this case totaling to 623 million starting in 2025, discounted last year's earnings rate of 6.75%. A related topic on this is that um, the actuarial analysis is, does not assume that there are any future contracts. It's only based on contracts that are existing. But there's a general assumption that the program is ongoing and it maintains its, the uh, asset allocation and an investment fund that continue to um, earn its, the assumed investment rate. If the program is assumed not to be ongoing, then as the investment fund appears to be depleted, the actuarial, excuse me, the, um, uh, the earnings assumption is reduced to something lower. In, in our case, we've been using 4% as the investment fund is depleted. So for 2017, we're no longer going to be making the general assumption that the program is ongoing due to an increased uh, level of uncertainty, and we expect that to increase the unfunded liability. In projections last year, um, where we implemented the lower earnings rate as the fund was depleted, um, the $264 million unfunded liability turned into $348 million, um, and we'll review uh, this in more detail later. Turning to slide 20, just briefly talk about some of the causes of the actuarial funding liability. Generally, it's just because earnings, investment earnings have not kept up with tuition. Eric mentioned the hyperinflation early in the program's history. There's also an issue related to tuition discounting, where more and more students are receiving receiving a discount on their tuition, and so the net revenue received by the universities is less, but ISAC continues, or actually the program continues to pay full sticker price. On the investment side, uh, performance has lagged tuition inflation as well as public plan peers. Primarily, this is related to allocation and investment decisions from prior management. These decisions may have been reasonable at the time, but in retrospect, they were suboptimum with long-lasting impact due to commitments to private equity structures that have underperformed and could not be economically undone. So, private equity, you, have to, you commit that you're going to be uh, in these funds and you really can't get out of them once you're in. Some of them work fine, uh, but a couple have not. Um, a, related issue is, a related issue is the timing of cash flows. It matters when the money comes in and goes out. For example, we had our strongest sales year in, in the first year of the program, FY99. It was really double any uh, subsequent year. And, and so that money was invested kind of right before that, uh, again, kind of during the tech bubble and right before that crash. It was the luck of the draw, but you know, it would have been a lot better if we would opened a year later and had been investing those initial funds kind of in 2000, 2001. We also had a market correction in 2008, and we had a, uh, a cash flow dynamic going on then when um, a lot of the initial contracts, those students were graduating and starting college, so we had a ramp up in students attending college and therefore an increase in tuition going out, in tuition payments going out the door. And, you know, that's happening right as the, um, the investment fund is kind of the value is down because of market losses um, following the economic crisis, which is not a problem. You know, if you just hang on and the market goes down, it comes back up. But if you have to pay tuition, then you're locked in those losses. And so we have that, that dynamic going on. Going to the next slide, we're uh, going to talk about some of the trends. So we, we do remain underfunded, but there have been significant improvements in recent years. The unfunded liability was $536 million in 2011. Um, and it's down to 264. Even if we kind of use the lower discount rate and compare that to 348 million, it's still much improved. The key driver of the improvement was lower than expected tuition, so the actual tuition inflation was lower than we had in, um, that had been assumed in prior actuarial reports. Also, investment earnings were relatively strong, and uh, so that that helped as well. Again, I've added a bullet here, kind of about the expectation that the unfunded liability, although improved, will increase somewhat uh, in the next year. 
Another way of looking at this, which is somewhat less um, sensitive to the discount rate, is the total amount of money expected to, to be needed to make the program whole or to take care of all the obligations in future years. So, as I talked about previously, that number is currently estimated at 623 million. Back in 2011, it was over. It was uh, a little less than 1.6 billion. So that's improved by 942 million. The next slide shows that in a graphical format uh, chart, and the next slide. Um, kind of summarizes all that I've just talked about. So on the far right column, which uh, is headed 63016, you can see the unfunded liability of 264 million at the top. At the bottom, the total expected solvency contributions of 623 million with the first contribution uh, needed in 2025, compared to the second column from the left, uh, June 30, 2011, when the unfunded liability was 536 million, and the amount of future solvency required. Uh, requirements were 1.6 million, actually 1.565 billion, uh, with initial requirements in 2022. Now I'd like to talk about um, kind of scenarios of of stopping sales and continuing sales. I need to just catch my um, there. Get get back on track here. Um, and so the first thing I want to mention here is that we're framed from talking about shutting down the program. It's not really an option. Uh, we can't just give everyone their money back. Uh, but we can't stop selling new contracts. And so slide 24 um, shows kind of what our alternatives are for, for stopping contract sales. We basically have two options. We can just stop uh, selling contracts. In that case, all beneficiaries um, get their, the benefits they expect. Uh, we also have the option to declare the program infeasible. The, it's a kind of combination of the, uh, the commission and the governor. Uh, and in that case, we refund all contracts that are within five years of uh, matriculation. All the beneficiaries that are either going to school or within five years, excuse me, beyond five years, you get a refund. Within five years, you get the benefits. Um, comparing those two in terms of the uh, economic impact or the outlays, the uh, statutory infeasibility or liquidation actually has lower total expected outlays, uh, but the funding requirements are earlier and a little larger. The runoff scenario total outlay is a little bit, um, is, is larger. On a present value basis, they're pretty close to each other. Turning to the next slide on new contract sales, um, this is the only option that can eliminate, uh, reduce or eliminate the unfunded liability, so we keep our options open. Uh, new contracts help to reduce the liability and can even eliminate it. Uh, we need about 1,500 con contracts a year to uh, begin restoring the funded status. Um, and to get there, although we've been much above that early in the program, with where we are right now, we think we're going to need something to improve the public confidence in the plan. Slide 26 uh, details the scenarios I've just gone through. Um, it kind of shows you when the money uh, will potentially go, um, would be needed to be called. So kind of an order of how I talked about on the second uh, column from the left is the runoff scenario. Uh, expected first uh, funding need is an FY25 of 81 million, peaks the next year to 110 million, total of 623 million with a present value of 348. Um, again, using that lower discount rate, it's 348 versus 264. The early funding scenario is basically the runoff, but it um, assumes that the state starts providing funds to the program right away. This was as of last year, so it actually shows funding this past year. FY17, obviously, it would be different for the next year. Um, 26 million, actually just slightly less than 26 million a year for a total of 439 million. In this case, the net present value is that 264 because the, dis the earnings rate is maintained uh, throughout the program. Liquidation is the next column. You can see there the, um, the funding requirements start earlier, FY21 at 58 million. Peaks the next year at 124 million, total of 523 million, um, and with a present value of 369. And the final column to the right just shows what it would look at with 500 contracts a year, and the fact that even if the, the contracts don't completely mitigate the unfunded lib uh, or don't eliminate the unfunded liability, they do mitigate it. So the, the cumulative um, expected uh, excess funding from the state is reduced, um, and and the the timing is um, pushed out a little bit. Next slide on 27 shows us in graphical format with the, the blue bar showing what the liquidation looks like. Again, funding needed earlier and a little bit bigger. Orange is the runoff. 
Gray is the level funding or the early funding option. And yellow is what it looks like with um, 500 contracts a year. As we've alluded to, or um, you know, we do think contract sales can solve the problem to give kind of an order of magnitude. We've been selling slightly less than 500 contracts a year recently in the last couple of years. Um, if we can get it to 1,000 contracts, that um, eliminates the need for state funding. That's what it looked like last year. It could be different this year. Um, 1,500 contracts uh, annually restore solvency. Um, well, that's really all I need to say on this slide. The next slide shows what the funded status um, would look like kind of over time at 1,500 contracts. It stays at about, you know, $300 million unfunded or so uh, for several years, and then it starts uh, climbing out of the hole uh, in the uh, early 2030s and eventually around 2042 it's uh, level funding. All of these kind of coming back to the initial qualification, these are all based on actuarial assumptions that will, you know, not come to pass, you know, exactly as they've been assumed. Um, kind of coming back to the, uh, the, the key levers that Eric talked about early, uh, early in the presentation. Low, inflation, low tuition inflation helps, strong investment earnings help, contract sales help. Uh, so that was quick actuarial stuff. I, I'm sure you have, or may have questions, but that's all. Back to you, Eric. Thanks. So um, as I said at the beginning, you Eric, know, we are here today as part of our Eric, efforts. Eric, excuse me for one second. I would like to add Representative Riley to the role. So as we kind of wrap up our part and then go to questions, you know, as I said at the beginning, we're really here today as part of an effort to proactively address the challenges the plan faces. We didn't want to wait until it becomes a crisis. We think it's important to proactively address it. We do continue to believe that the challenges can be addressed with the help of our elected officials. At this point for FY18, our program enrollment really is on hold as we have these legislative discussions. Uh, we will, of course, continue to prudently manage the plan funds, you know, run the operations, continue to pay benefits to our current plan holders as their students are uh, returning to or going to college this fall. And we really want to continue to work with our policymakers to provide information, research, and insights regarding potential legislative action. So with that, we would be happy to answer any questions anybody may have. One of the things that had happened is, as we saw that hyperinflation of tuition, we mentioned that tuition inflation, tuition and mandatory fees, grew close to 10% a year for a 10-year period of time, we had, we had assumptions about future tuition inflation that were pretty high. As tuition inflation began to moderate, that allowed us to adjust our contract pricing. And different contracts changed at a different level, and we also moved to, rather than bands of contract pricing, where each year the contract price changes. So if you have a newborn that's different than a one-year-old, two-year-old, et cetera, with the lowest price being for the newborn. We got, we thought good market receptivity of that. Um, the contracts were still priced appropriately, so we work with our actuaries to make sure that, you know, we believe based on the actuarial assumptions that the contracts are being priced at a level where the plan will uh, be good with that. Um, so it was really an, it was an, uh, an effort to address the you know, value proposition, if you will, of the contract prices, given what had happened with tuition inflation and the moderation. So during this time, have you ever been able to negotiate a discount with the universities? So we have never, we have never been able to negotiate a discount. We haven't really, there were some discussions with universities in kind of that FY 11, 12 timeframe, but we have not negotiated a discount with universities. I would say generally when we, you know, talk with university folks about the idea and we say, hey, we have a great idea, we'd like to pay you less. Um, they're not surprisingly not that interested. Uh, there was a lot of concern at that time even about what was happening with state appropriations and uh, they were feeling a lot of financial pressures. Obviously those pressures increased dramatically over the last two or three years. Um, so I'd say that, you know, we would be interested in having those discussions, but for the most part, that just conversation is we'd like, to, you to pay, we'd like to pay you less. What do you think? Um, so on page 20, you talk about UIUC net discount of 19%. So I interpret this to mean they discounted their prices to normal students, 
but not to College Illinois students. So what, you know, and I would quickly say we're not necessarily the experts on enrollment strategies at schools and how they manage their financial aid, but basically what I think you'll find is that students pay very different prices depending on, in some cases, financial need, in some cases based on merit, um, and how the schools are trying to build their class of students and attract students to their school. So the discount that we show here is an estimated discount across their entire student body. So there will be students that are paying full sticker price and a significant percentage of students pay full sticker price. Others may pay nothing or a you know, significant discount. And the way College Illinois works is if the student receives a scholarship, they get the benefit of the scholarship. So in essence, College Illinois takes into account that they got a scholarship and that maintains part of their benefit. And I say that's one of the key elements really in being able to sell contracts. One of the questions I always get when we talk to prospective purchasers, one of the first questions is, well, what if my kid gets a scholarship? Because I think they're gonna get a full ride in athletics or music or whatever it might be, or maybe they're, they'll get a full ride academically. So we always get the question, well, what happens if they get a scholarship? And the way the plan is structured is the student or the contract holder gets the benefit of that scholarship. Okay. On slide 14, you show UIUC and the Illinois four-year average compared to the national four-year average at, as being significantly higher. Has ISAC done any research into why Illinois costs may be higher than the national average you're showing? You know, I would say we haven't specifically done research. We have a lot of data. We have a lot of information. There's a lot of speculation. One of the issues is Illinois is known as a high tuition, high aid state. So different states and different schools have different strategies around tuition and sort of tuition management. Some try to keep their tuition really low and they offer very little financial aid. Other schools or other states have a high tuition, high aid model. Historically, Illinois has been much more in the camp of high tuition, high aid. So one of the challenges in comparing these charts is depending on the strategy, it probably would be really better to look at a, disc, you know, a discounted net tuition comparison, but that data is actually pretty hard to get on kind of a reliable basis. Mm -hmm. To your solutions, the scenarios you've laid out, you're saying we could sell somewhere around 500 contracts a year. Based on your track record, how is that going to be achievable? So I think 500 contracts a year is what we've really been selling over the past few years. Um, so we think we could sell at that level. The challenge is that doesn't address the problem. That doesn't address the unfunded liability. We really need to be more in the 1,000 to 1,500 a contract a year range. And quite frankly, we think that we need stronger support from the state to be able to do that. So one of the challenges or the questions we get when we talk with potential contract purchasers is they'll say, well, I looked at the actuarial report and it says you're going to run out of money in so many years. And well, what will happen then? And we explain the moral obligation. Well, it's backed by the moral obligation of the state. And if the plan were ever to run out of money, that requires us to certify an amount to the governor. The governor's required to request that funding from the General Assembly. Then it's up to the General Assembly to decide whether or not to appropriate the money on a year-by-year -year basis. Now, our understanding and belief is the state has never not lived up to its moral obligation, but there's not a legal requirement that they do that. And quite frankly, that's not, that has become not a very satisfactory answer for people. When they look at the situation in Illinois, that doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. So the question we have, is there a stronger support from the state that would make that, you know, that answer, it's backed by the state. It's backed by the state and you don't have to worry about it. So we think with stronger support from the state, we could have an opportunity to rebuild contract sales into that 1,000 to 1,500 level or more that would restore the solvency, would restore the, reduce the unfunded status and make the plan sustainable over time. Um, we don't know that that would happen instantly. You know, when you think about it, College Illinois is a brand. The state of Illinois is a brand. And there's been, quite frankly, a lot of 
damage been done to the brands, both College Illinois and the state of Illinois. So I think that that may take some time to rebuild, but we think that that would give us a good opportunity at it. Being able to say the plan, the contracts are really fully backed by the state, we think would be important and could potentially allow us to, you know, build and grow out of the challenge over time. So maybe this is embedded in one of your scenarios here, but what happens if we transfer those contracts beyond six years to something like Bright Start or give the contract holder an option of where they transfer and simply look at the obligation for those one through six years as paying in full? What do what the finances look like in that scenario? Sure. So basically, as you know, Kent described it, if we, um, when you look at the, the relative cost, if you will, of the contracts that are within five years of matriculation and those that are beyond, on a present value basis, they're very close. Actually, it's a little bit, um, the present value unfunded liability is actually slightly higher if you do the infeasibility, what you're describing, where you, the contracts that are more than five years out, you just pay them back with interest. Um, but they're pretty close. What that does is it accelerates the time of when the money is needed. Now, right now, anybody who has a College of Illinois contract can roll over their benefit to Bright Start or Bright Directions or another 529 plan. So they have that ability to do it now. So it, the answer is it doesn't really significantly reduces the state's obligation. On a present value basis, it's actually a little bit higher and it accelerates it so the money is needed much sooner. I'm just looking at that as a scenario where we might not be able to get the state to have full faith and credit and additional funding. So is this a better scenario for getting out of the current situation? It really is not a better scenario or not. Um, depending on how you look at it, I think it's actually a worse scenario. Thank you. Any other questions we can answer? Okay, sorry. Representative Batnick, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just was jotting down notes, so I apologize if it's kind of just a bunch of bullets, uh, not in necessarily in order, and Representative Pritchard had uh, taken some of them, some of the questions. But what is the average contract amount? Obviously, every person doesn't come in and buy eight semesters of tuition. So what is the average contract amount that uh, a person buys? You know, I don't know that I offhand that I know the average, but that's something that we can get for you. I do, we do have breakdowns, so we know each year, you know, how many people buy community college contracts versus university versus university plus. So it tends to be around 10% in that range are community college contracts, and then it's roughly um, 40, 45% university or university plus contracts. But as you know, people can buy from one semester up to four semesters of community college and actually up to nine semesters of university. So we have breakdowns by year. I just don't have that information off the top of my head. But okay, and it, there's been some discussion about the people that are five years and back farther. And, and what is, do you have a percentage breakdown of the unfunded liability? It, well, I'll ask it two ways. The number of people that are more than five years from going into college, percentage-wise, and then also in an unfunded liability. You know, are the older, do the older people buy more tuition, uh, more semesters or less semesters, or is it about the same across the board? Do you have any, any ideas on that? The contract, um, the types of contracts between those two types? Well, I'm, I'm looking for a percentage, like, so of the unfunded liability, of the, of, I shouldn't say unfunded liability, of the liability, is a lot of it people five years or less? What percentage of it is people five years or less? What percentage of it is people more than five years away from attending college? Do you have that breakdown by chance? Yeah, so essentially, if you look at page 26, the table. Yep. So basically, on a present value basis, on a runoff scenario where everybody got the benefit of the bargain, the unfunded, the present value unfunded liability is about $348 million. This is, once again, as of June 30, 2016. So I would caution that we're up, you know, we'll be updating those numbers as of June 30, 2017. If you look at then the liquidation scenario, it's actually $369 million. So it tells me that basically more than all of the unfunded 
liability relates to people who have contracts within five years of matriculation. And that the people who bought contracts where it, they're more than five years from going is actually a net positive to the plan. Okay. Well, I don't think we, we have the information at the top of our head to answer your specific question, which I think is kind of, um, if I understand the question, it's what is being spent um, each year for the students that are within five years now, kind of which, which students aren't. Right. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, that, that, that's similar, but I'm not looking at the unfunded liability per person, per se, I guess. I'm looking at, it, I shouldn't even have said unfunded liability. I'm looking at the total liability. What we have, we have. Mm -hmm. And whether somebody wins one year or loses one year based on when their kid was born with the market, some are going to be positive, some are going to be negative. I'm looking at of the overall liability, um, of, or the net present value of the liability, that five-year mark seems to be a, a marker that we're talking about. What percentage of the liability is five years and less, and what's five years and more? You know, is it 50-50? Is it 30-70? And because and, um, it would make a big difference if the if if the liability was huge five years out, then that makes a big difference. Then then if then if it's not in terms of how to how to what action to take and how to how to how to address it um so we can get we'll work on getting you that number i think we'll find that the majority if not the vast majority of the liability will for be for contracts where they're already using the benefit or they're within five years okay yeah i guess that's a whole another group too the ones using the benefit yeah. um did you did you did you have an idea of the average semester spot I don't okay any ID, even off the cuff, I won't hold you to it. But I mean, are, are most people buying like two years worth of college as they go, or are they one or four? I, when I look at the charts like that, I just remember it seemed like it was a pretty, um, I don't want to say evenly distributed, but it's distributed across all the options with a slight uptick um, in uh, kind of the, the um, two years and four years, kind of those. Uh, Okay, so if you had to guess, maybe two and a half years would be an average contract bought. Um, I mean, that would be a, a rational kind of extension of what I just okay. said. Okay, and then you say you're using an earnings rate of 6.75, is that correct right now for your actuarial assumptions? Uh, last year we used 6.75. We are taking it, we, we're um, probably taking it down this year. The actuarial analysis is still going, but we've okay. preliminary looking at 6.5%. Okay, and then what it, what's the expected inflation rate of tuition that you guys have been using? Right now we're using uh, 5%. Uh, we have brought that down uh, because it, it was, was uh, initially kind of back in the 2012 time frame, um, it was a really high number, like 9% forever. And we said, well, that's not, that's. Right, because we actually have a little bit of control over that. And I mean, the fact that tuition outpaces inflation, you can't do that to infinity. Right. Exactly. I mean, even 10%, I mean, I mean, at some point, it should be, the right number should be, it should, there's no reason for college to cost to inflate more than the rate of inflation. Um, it'd be interesting to do an analysis of what your unfunded liability would be if over the next 13 years, the cost of tuition in Illinois just paced inflation. Because frankly, I think it's too high in this state anyway. Um, so bringing it down would help tremendously. And I don't know how hard it is to throw it into a, a spreadsheet or an actuarial table and, and make those little assumption changes and see what they do. But it would be fascinating to see what, if we made changes on our end to keep tuition at the rate of inflation, what it would do to your unfunded liability. I imagine it would eliminate quite a bit of it, but. Yeah, we have sensitivity analysis on that as part of the actuarial report, so if tuition inflation turns out to be higher or less than expected, or if investment earnings turn out to be higher or less than expected, each year the actuary provides us basically a sensitivity analysis of the impact of that. Okay, I would love to see that, that run. Yeah, we can uh, provide that. It's actually publicly in our actuarial report that's on our website. Okay, um, and, and how do you deal with the full sticker price issue? Because it is, it, almost nobody pays full sticker price for a car. Um, do you have any ideas on how the legislat legislators can address that particular issue? Because if there was a, if, if your plan was hugely fully funded, I would, I would intentionally as a college president jack up the price of my uh, tuition at school. Um, because, and then I would give everybody who's not in the system a break to get as many people as I can in. 
do you have any any suggestions on how to handle it? I mean, it, it actually is it's prohibitive to have too many people in your plan um, because that's what I would do. So I'd say one thing to keep in mind is, you know, College Illinois contract holders tend to be a relatively small portion of any school's enrollment. So even at, you know, the biggest for College Illinois would be University of Illinois, particularly Urbana-Champaign. And, you know, I think if I remember right, College Illinois contract holders would be less than 5% of the enrollment. So they're not driving the university or the university's actions. I would say that, you know, from a discounting perspective, there's obviously a whole bunch of ways you could think about it. One is just to say, you know, for if it's College Illinois contract holder, College Illinois pays 85 cents on the dollar, pick a percentage, you know, something that might relate close to what their net tuition, you know, what their net uh, tuition is. It actually is. But the contract holder still gets the benefit of their bargain, which is their fees are covered, so they're not expected to make up the difference. I mean, you could do more complicated and try, you know, try to tie it to their actual, you know, discounted tuition each year, which I think would be a lot more challenging. But, you know, I think, for example, you know, if we paid 85 cents on the dollar to Illinois schools, that would save the plan about $8 million a year. Do you know what that would do to your overall unfunded liability? It would not dramatically improve our overall unfunded liability, but it reduces those future outflows. I'm wondering how that math works, how, you, how if you're going to pay out a 15% less in the future, how it doesn't change your unfunded liability. So not, Go ahead. So we're not paying out 15% less because we can only do that with Illinois schools. Uh, Got it. So the, Understood. The, the uh, Illinois um, attendance of contract holders has been dropping because it used to you just opened up a whole other question. What's the percentage of, of, of these plans that are paid to Illinois schools? That's, so it's dropped from about 60% early in the program to about 40% now. What's been 60 to 40? What's been the timeline of that drop? I don't recall exactly. Maybe, uh, you know. Okay. I, I, I know that. I, I know. I too, one piece of that, too, to keep in mind is I think you're referencing the public universities and community colleges. There's also college Illinois contracts that are used at private schools in Illinois. And historically, I, my recollection is that's been about 15, 15 to 20 percent of contract usage has been at private uh, universities in Illinois. Okay. I believe I read somewhere that when these plans and other states ran out of money, they just legislated that the state universities had to accept them. Did that really happen? I'm not aware of where the state universities have had to just accept students. Okay. I think in some cases there have been states where they capped tuition for the state schools for a period of time. You know, Got that it. was capped at a certain year. But I'm not aware of a state where they were required just to take the students for free. So and this is my last question. I've taken a lot of time. So if we were to do the, um, I guess, early funding where you stop selling future contracts and early funding, um, how big of an, you know, how big of an administrative cost is it for the few, you know, less than a thousand contracts the last few years? How big of an administrative cost is it to the plan? How, I have no idea how large your office is. I'm not saying you don't work hard and need people. I'm just curious. That there has to be. There's an administrative cost associated with slowly letting the plan go off the books, how, how big is that? We would have to estimate that. I mean, obviously, we would minimize the administrative cost to the extent we can. And because College Illinois is part of ISAC, we only allocate portions of people's time, you know, for making payments or for accounting or mm -hmm. those kind of things. So we actually track, people track their hours based on what they're working on. So we only charge College Illinois the amount of time that people are actually utilizing or working on College Illinois issues. Okay. I guess that's close enough. An so, answer. you know, yeah. the challenge will be you, know, you, you always have a level of fixed cost to have a plan. Exactly. And as and that's it runs down, to. the percentage of fixed costs compared to the total plan will increase. Well, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it in, in, in yearly man hours. I mean, is mm -hmm. this something that's five man hours a year, 23? Um, you know, you have people work, if, if somebody works on it half the time, then they're half a man hour for a year. Right. So what, if you, do you have a guesstimate of the size of the administrative costs for the plan? We know exactly what our administrative costs are. I don't know it in man hours necessarily, okay. but we are audited. So there's a separate audited financial statement for College Illinois. So we do know what the administrative costs are for the plan. 
Are they secret? Can you tell me? No, they're public. Oh. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. I mean, they are secret. <laughs> yeah, there are. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't, why don't we go on to other questions, and I'll ask one of our Yeah, that's, that's fine. That, that's the last thing that... Uh, I'd say, too, on your question about, you know, kind of where do people buy contracts. So I have it from the last enrollment period, and I would say it, it's actually pretty spread out. You know, there tends to be a little bit of a bump at, you know, four year, eight, I'm sorry, four semesters and eight semesters. Um, so there's quite a few. It's pretty evenly spread, one or two semesters, four semesters. Not a ton at five, six, or seven. Another kind of increase at eight. Uh, community colleges, we get quite a bit at one or two, and then the bulk are actually at four, four okay. semesters for community college. But it's actually pretty well spread. So it's not that everybody buys, you know, eight or nine semesters, or everybody buys one. I would say it's pretty <laughs> averages across the different contract types. I appreciate it. Thank you for answering my questions. Representative Davis. I'm right here, sir. Thank you. Um, as I was listening to your presentation, uh, I believe you alluded to the budget impasse as having a significant impact on your work, so to speak. So what happens if there is no budget next year? What do you think could happen, or what is your forecast? I, I'm not sure what word to use, but um, if there's no budget next year? For FY19? For FY19. So I'd say, you know, when you think about College of Illinois, we have an advantage in that, you know, all the assets of College of Illinois are in a trust fund that's held in custody at Northern Trust. So when contract holders make payments into the plan, those dollars go into a, a trust fund. And that trust fund can only be used to pay benefits of the program and the costs of running the program. So from a operational perspective, you know, we continue to operate. We continue to pay benefits, so whether or not we have a budget doesn't affect the current contract holders. The impact of the budget or the budget delay is really on future sales. So the question, you know, we get is, well, is there going to be higher education in Illinois or not? I mean, is there going to be a system of higher ed? Are the schools that are part of the program even going to exist anymore? So during the budget delay, those were the types of questions we got along with what happens, you know, when the plan or if the plan runs out of money, will there be support for, there for, for the, from the state? So I would say certainly we hope that there won't be, that there will, will be a budget for FY19. Um, I would say if there's not a budget and we get another round of budget delays, that will be a negative for, you know, being able to sell contracts for you know, for the plan, but it doesn't really affect the day-to-day -day operations of the plan as far as doing the investments, you know, paying contract benefits, et cetera. Just to clarify, though, we're currently, uh, enrollment is on hold, so we don't have a, a, we're not planning, we don't have a plan to open right away for enrollment, so we may not have sales. Right. Can you, um, can you either? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so we're, so Eric, Eric said uh, it would have a negative impact on sales, but that would only be if we were open for contract sales, which right now the, the opening of enrollment is on hold pending these discussions. Because on, uh, oh. we can't really continue okay. uh, to, uh, to open until we get the funding issue clarified. Well, I mean, the idea of a possible budget delay for FY19, clearly we don't know what's so does that mean you'll be on hold? No, I'm talking about our our um, not not budget, but the the uh, sales the program. I mean, budget. opening for new sales. Right. So typically, our enrollment period we have a definitive enrollment period. So, for example, this last year we started open enrollment on November 1st, and then enrollment closed for the main enrollment on May 31st. There was an extended enrollment for newborns. At this point, we are not planning. We have enrollment on hold for FY18 until we get some sense of what's going to, what could happen legislatively. We, at this point, we feel like moving forward with an enrollment period is not an appropriate thing to do as we're having discussions with the General Assembly about potential legislative action. Meaning the budget or other legislative action? Other legislative actions, things that would strengthen the program. Oh, okay. So, it, so it's based on that, not so much the budget conversation. Because I'm just That's saying that, that won't take place until essentially next year sometime. So I didn't know if you were going to hold 
until that conversation starts or we're really holding until we see legislative is there options for college illinois that would make sense and would support higher levels of contract sales okay i think i think i understand what you're saying and and i think my my other question i just wanted to to go back uh, the representative was asking about you had mentioned about a decline in uh um, I don't know if it was enrollment you were speaking of or um, something you said is about a 10 year decline and you started to say that and, and you kind of were cut off a little bit. So you remember what you were saying, sir, based oh, on the representative's question? Um, oh, we, we were, I was, I believe uh, we were talking about the percentage of beneficiaries that attended Illinois public Illinois. universities. Yeah. Okay, and you were saying that, that that decline basically has been over a ten year period. I was. That was a, a very rough guess. Rough, rough guess, because I because <laughs> I, I, I I think what the representative was looking for has it been over the last year and a half or so since we've had our budget challenges, if you will. Has it, have you seen it kind of drop off more there? But you're saying over the last ten years, based on probably a variety of factors, that's probably what has happened. Um, Would that be fair? It's broad based and it's also um, the, the, the payouts, so this is, we're looking at um, kind of who's attending, where the, where the attendees are and, uh, and what we're paying. And so once they're in school, you know, they're likely to continue. So the, it's not going to drop, you know, it'll always be mitigated by the people that are in school already. Okay. But um, to the extent um, that you can, do you, or if you look at, public institutions in the state of Illinois, uh, four-year institutions, that is, um, or, or maybe even the different categories, public four-year, private four-year, community college, do you have some analysis that speaks to where those contracts are going? Something? Well, we, we do yeah. have analysis. I don't know if you have it with you. We, mm -hmm. I, and I can't speak to it off the top of my head. Okay. We I was have just all curious. And we can slice it you know, slice it in. Particularly, uh, particularly when it comes to state universities, I'm just kind of curious to see what that what those trends are with regard to state universities and in, in, in particular yeah so we have data and we actually publish over since the inception of the program mm -hmm. where basically contract benefits have been used and over the life of the program to date about 50 percent of the benefits have been used at public universities or community colleges in illinois about 16 percent of the benefits have been used at private schools in illinois and about 34 percent of the benefits have been used out of state what ken mentioned earlier is that a lower percentage of the benefit if you looked at just last year or the last couple of years a lower percentage of the benefits are being used at public universities in illinois that's dropped to more like 40 percent so so is there is there is there a a comparison of that to a quote unquote increase in benefits going out of state? We'd say that directly tied to students deciding to go out of state rather than stay in state. Rather than I mean, stay That's where in they're state. deciding to use their benefits. Okay, but I, I, some, sometimes the, the conversation is, you know, you know, it's put out there that students are going out of state um, and, and they're making the correlation to kind of what's happening in, 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 in the state in terms of budget volatility. And, and, and sometimes I would argue that that's not always the case why many of our students may be going out of state. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I mean, you've got, athlete, you've got student athletes who are not getting chosen by Illinois state universities. Um, so they go play where they're being offered to, to play baseball or football or whatever the case may be. I mean, those kind of things also impact decisions as well. I, I just don't want to characterize it solely as because we've got these budget issues um, that that's the problem, even yeah. though we could probably make an ex extrapolation that uh, an, a, a governor's introduced budget of cutting universities at 30 percent probably freaked people out as well. Because they're going, well, if they lose 30% of their funding, are they going to be able to operate? Are they going to be able to do anything? So, yeah, let's make the decision to go out of state. And that is just not solely based on just the challenges that we've had in terms of passing a budget. I just want to, at least for me yeah. anyway. So I would say, you know, Illinois has been a net, they have, we've been a net exporter of students for many years. So, right. you know, we tend to be number two in the country behind New Jersey of exporting net more students um, that go to school in other states. Wow. I think that has been growing the okay. last few years. I think the budget um, right. challenges have been, and I think we're going to see that that 
They got a Republican governor too, huh? Well, I think that migration we'll see has increased, you know, whatever the cause. And obviously you saw the headlines, you know, from the last couple of years. Those are not positive things in recruiting students to go to Illinois schools. Right. And anecdotally, when we talk to college counselors, a lot of them have said, I advise my students to go out of state. Right. because they're just not sure or, go, or to go private in Illinois. But, you know, there's more questions about what will the state universities look like? Um, what kind of support are they going to have? If I start a program now, will my program still be there when I right. want to graduate in four years? Right. Um, and we know that, you know, some of the schools were very financially challenged during the budget delay. Right. And I would imagine, you know, we know some of our state universities are – uh, trending up their uh, in their uh, admissions criteria as well. So counselors are also looking at that going, you know, at least based on what I see in front of me, you're a great student, but Illinois schools won't accept you, you know, so maybe I would encourage you to go out of state, something like that. I mean, there's just so much to it. And unfortunately, right. you can't put that in any one particular whole and that's that's I think at least from my perspective versus trying to say it's for that reason that these are these are the things that are happening you know and that's just from my experiences as a college admissions counselor in terms of advising students to make decisions uh, about where they think they would be better served uh, as well so anyway but uh, thank you very much for your answers to my questions appreciate it represent representative fine uh, thank you. Just a few quick questions. Um, what if you invest in the program and your s child decides later on they don't want to go to a college? Um, do you get the money back or does the money just stay within the program or how does that work? So if you've bought a college loan and know a contract for your beneficiary and they decide not to go to college, first of all, they can defer that decision until later. So it's not that they have to use that money immediately coming out of high school. So if they go into the military, they decide to do something else, basically the contract will remain in place for I think it's 10 years before they have to make a decision. If the beneficiary ultimately decides not to go to college, the uh, contract benefit can be transferred to another family member. So if there's another child or you know somebody who's related and ultimately if there's nobody that's gonna use it, we refund your money. Oh, you do refund the money That's then. That's correct. Is um, there a large tax penalty for that refund? Do you know? So generally, if you're refunding the money, there would not be any sort of tax penalty because there's not really earnings on the money. So basically, under mm -hmm. with a 529 plan, you know, you are tax exempt, if you will, for the growth in the value mm -hmm. of the plan as long as it's used for qualified educational mm -hmm. expenses. The one caveat I guess I would offer or would say is. For the person in Illinois, there's a tax deduction for contributions to a 529 plan for you know either College Illinois or Bright Star Bright Directions. And if it is refunded, we believe that you have to then report that as income. And basically, you're recapturing, there's a repayment of your tax benefit. But basically, we refund the money, and there's not other tax consequences other than that. Okay. Um, earlier also, you talked about if a child gets a scholarship, and I wasn't quite sure of how that worked. Uh, so let's say you invested in the program and your child gets a, a $10,000 scholarship. Is, are you, you know, it, is that extra money deferred for later then, or what takes place? So basically, plan holders can choose to do one of a, a couple things. One is, so let's say if I have a semester and I get a scholarship that you know, covers half the cost, then I can either keep my benefit and now utilize that for the next semester, um, or you can actually get a refund of the amount of the scholarship. Okay, thank you. It's a little more technical than that, so I would, you know, to deep explanation, I'd need our operational folks, but basically you can get a refund of the value of the scholarship, or you can utilize less of your College Illinois benefit and save that for a future semester, future year. Representative Welch. Thank you, Chairman Burke. Uh, Eric, thank you both for uh, being here uh, today and testifying about this issue. As a parent with a five-year-old and three-year-old, this topic is very much of interest to me. Uh, so I, I just have a few questions uh, for you. Um, I know many people, when you have a meeting like this in downtown Chicago, we want to make sure they leave with, you know, the accurate impression 
clearly we are concerned about the uh, viability of this program long term or we wouldn't be here. Uh, however, uh, are we saying that College of Illinois will not be around next year? Is that what you're saying here today? No, College of Illinois will continue to be around. So once again, with without sold any, contracts. Without any, without any new contracts or commitment from the state, uh, you know, clearly we had trouble getting a budget. Mm -hmm. uh, without any new commitment from the state, how long is College of Illinois going to be around? So basically, and you saw in the presentation, based on the actuarial projections, if there are new, no new contract sales, and I would, let me find the page and I'll direct you to it. Page 20, the table, page 26. So once again, as of June 30, 2016, so last year, we'll be, we're in the process of updating the actuarial projections, working with our actuaries under a runoff scenario, which is basically the plan continues to operate, but we don't sell any new contracts, we would first need support from the state in fiscal year 2025 through the moral obligation of the state. So without any changes or new commitments, we're good through 2025? Once again, that I, we always caution that the actuarial estimates are as of a point in time. They will vary year to year. So the June 30, 2017 update may show a different year. It may move up or down. Um, but basically, as of June 30 last year, that's correct. Understood. And your, your, your presentation, I think I saw that Illinois currently has about 38,000 contracts. That's correct. What's your high watermark, what, if, you, if you know? Well, in total, there was over 70,000 contracts that have been sold. So a number of the contracts have either been you know, fully utilized or canceled. So, so the 38,000 is roughly the number that have remaining benefits and are still outstanding. And we know that Alabama, Florida, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, Mississippi, Nevada, Texas, Virginia, and Pennsylvania have similar programs. How does our 38,000 compare to what those states have right now in terms of contracts? So we would be um, much smaller than Florida. We tend to be in the fourth or fifth largest. Let me just look. Even at 38,000, we're fourth or fifth largest? You know, I'm thinking about the dollars of assets invested in the plan as a proxy for the number of contracts that are outstanding. Let me see. Okay. While you look for that, let me ask another okay. question. I, I wrote a note. You made a statement uh, that College Illinois is a 529 prepaid program and Bright Start is a 529 savings plan. That's correct. For those who don't know the difference, can you explain what the difference is? Sure. So basically a savings plan would be similar to like a 401k plan. You decide how much you want to contribute to the plan within limits. Um, you put that money into the plan, and then you pick from a range of investment choices, similar to like a 401k plan, where you make investment choices. Do you want to put the money in equities or in bonds or some sort of mix? And then ultimately, the value you have for college is whatever, how much you've put in and what it's earned. So there's no protection or no certainty about will the amount you've saved be enough for uh, the cost of college in the future. And Where the prepaid tuition program, you're actually buying future semesters of tuition at today's contract price. At today's tuition prices too, correct? Well, it's really at today's contract price. So typically the contract price is higher than today's current tuition. But as tuition continues to grow year after year, it may not keep pace with tuition rates. So, it, 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 so there are direct you're, you're buying a semester of college, so no matter what college costs, um, in what, no matter what Illinois University college costs in 18 years if you bought for a newborn, the program is going to cover that. Um, so that gotcha. I so understand. That's one of the real appeals for people. I get the question all the time, how much do you need to save for college? Now, college and, Illinois is, is uh, administered by ISAC. Correct. 
That's correct. And Bright Start is by the treasurer's office? That's correct. You guys have no involvement in Bright Start? No. Okay. Were you able to chase down that number with regard to how we compare to the other states? Yeah, so this is based on asset size, which should be a proxy for, you know, number of contracts. So we, you know, the largest is Florida, which is over $11 billion in assets. Virginia is about $2.4 billion. Pennsylvania, a little under $2 billion. And then Michigan, Illinois, Maryland are all around in that billion dollar range. Uh, Texas, about $700 million. And then there's a number, there's several in the less, $400 million or less range, which would be like Mississippi, Nevada, Massachusetts. Okay. And then lastly, um, I'll wrap up. You know, uh, clearly the budget impasse did not do this program any favors. Uh, and as my colleague, uh, Chairman Davis said, uh, you know, next year, if there's another budget impasse, that won't help the program either, correct? I would say that's fair yeah. statement. I mean, the bottom line is, is the, the more we create concern, whether or not our colleges and universities will be here, the more people will stay away from investing in programs like this, correct? I believe that's correct, yes. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate your attendance. I just have a, a couple of questions. Eric, you mentioned that in 2011 there was uh, a, a time where a lot of people pulled their money out, or, or an unusually high number, and meant many have regretted it, as you've said. But uh, who were those folks who took the money out? Were, were, was it people whose kids were close to attending school, or were they farther out? And I guess my, my point being, um, is, there, is that any predictor of any future situations where, where there would be, um, if we ever got to a situation where, you know, there was a um, additional <coughs> run on the program, would you, would, it, would you think that it would be people who are closer to attending college or those who are farther out? Yeah, so I'd say the, the, the bump in cancellations that we saw in that kind of 2011 time period, I don't know specifically who canceled and where they were, I would suspect that they were people that were probably further mm -hmm. out, but it may have also been people that were closer. So I think one of the challenges right now for the plan when you think about it, so if, you have, if you're a college and only contract holder and your child's five years away from going or four years or six years or whatever, the question you have is, well, do I think there's gonna be enough money when my child goes? And if there's not enough money, do I think the state will live up to its moral obligation? Or do I, come, you know, or do I say, I'm not, I don't trust the state, I don't know, I'm too uncertain, and I just pull my money out? So I think there's a mixture of people. You know, it depends on their confidence level in the state, how confident, how concerned they are about it. It may also relate to the rest of their financial situation. But that's kind of the position people are in. You know, if I'm my child's going next year, I can probably look at it and say, well, I think it's a good chance the money's going to be there and I'm good. If I'm five years away, maybe not as, you know, good or eight years away. So I think it's really based a lot on, you know, how much do people trust the state of Illinois and that the moral obligation will be fulfilled. And um, you and I have talked a lot about uh, communications you've had directly from contract holders that you end up you you talk to a lot of people who are contract holders on a uh, twice a year or yearly basis they call you, you you respond to them personally to tell them what's going on with the program um, which I think is is uh, very it's great I mean I think people um, appreciate that outreach but um, one of the things that you've commented to me before is that uh, most of the people you talk to are not wealthy people, that they took this investment as a way to ensure that they could save for their kids' education and that the overwhelming majority of them are kind of middle class, regular people. Is that, that that's still true, I imagine? Yeah, so I think there's obviously a mix of contract purchasers and you know, there will be some who are higher income. And quite frankly, if you're really wealthy, you don't worry about it, you just write a check. I mean. You know, for people that are really wealthy, paying for college is not a burden. You know, we still, probably about half the contract sales, people pay on installment, mm -hmm. which tells me that 
you know, they're not people who can just write a check. They're people who are, um, you know, they're making payments for it. And I, I met with contract holders who were like, yeah, when my, when I had a baby, you know, we bought what we, we figured out what we could afford. And by the time, you know, we paid in on installments and by the time the child was going to kindergarten, we had part of college paid for. So I think that, you know, there are a variety of reasons on how people pay for it, but we still see a lot done in installments, which tells me these are people who can't write, just write a check. And we, I actually meet, one of the people I meet with is a grandfather who's bought nine College Illinois contracts for his nine grandchildren. And I asked him, you know, why, you know, why did you do that and what was your thinking behind it? And essentially what he said is, well, I'm, I don't really trust my kids with the money. <laughs> And you know he was nicer about it than that, but it was like I want to know that that money is set aside for my grandkids, and this way I know that it's going to sort of outlive me. It'll be there, and they may or may not decide to use it. Um, they may not take advantage of it, but I want to give them a leg up in life, and that's as a grandfather kind of the legacy that I want to leave for them. And so there's a variety of reasons people buy the contracts, and one is they just want to know the money set aside for college for their child or grandchild and it isn't going to be used for something else you know not going to use it to go buy a boat or go you know pay for something else that the money's really set aside um and i'd um, say too by the way there's a lot of state employees who bought college mm -hmm. illinois contracts um i meet them all the time um who are like that really made the difference that allowed me to send my kid to college and so this is, you know, this is, I think, much more kind of a middle class, upper middle class kind of program um, that's important. It's an important way for people to plan for college. Okay. Um, and the College Illinois program is not the only prepaid tuition program in the country that's experienced some ups and downs. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. Um, and of the ones we talked about, um, I mean, some of them are closed, like Alabama is closed. That's correct. Uh, Michigan. Did Michigan Michigan's, close and then they reopened in a different format? Yeah, so Michigan had a, a plan that they closed and then they opened a new plan. Texas also had a plan they closed and then they new, opened a new program. So my recollection is there's maybe, there's like 11 or 12 plans that are still open and there's like nine or 10 that have been closed. In some, it's the same state. They've closed one, but they've opened a new one. And when they when they open a new program, is it uh, obviously, the intent is the same, that you're trying to guarantee a, a, a certain level of benefit. Um, but do they revamp? What, what, what are they changing when they um, reopen the programs? So in some cases, for example, Texas, they've really tied their program. The original Texas plan was full faith and credit of the state. And they ended up closing that program. The program that they opened as a new program ties basically the earnings of the plan to the tuition rate that the schools receive. So they're much more in sync where they'll never get underfunded because it essentially caps tuition for students at the state universities. Mm -hmm. So there's different things that different states have done around benefits, around backing by the state, around trying to tie the plan more directly to what the schools receive for tuition and fees for students that go to their schools. Okay. Um, any further questions of the committee? We did have the answer for Representative Batnick. Oh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Representative Riley. I didn't see you raise your hand. <laughs> Please, Representative Riley, proceed. Thank you for coming. Uh, I want to get my two cents in. After uh, some of those questions earlier, I know Reverend Thomas Bays is spinning in his grave uh, somewhere in England. Regarding uh, these actuarial uh, numbers, uh, tuition inflation, you talked about 10% annualized tuition inflation between 2000 and 2010. Um, do you think that the diminution of monies appropriated from the uh, General Assembly uh, is a proxy variable for that? Or is a significant one for that? So I would say, you know, and I, I would quickly say we haven't done sort of some detailed analysis of that. You know, the 
uh, appropriations from the state relative to higher ed have been a reducing percentage of the university's budget. And obviously that tends to go into increasing tuition and fees. There was a research study that was done relative to truth and tuition. And while it was well intended to try to hold down uh, tuition and fee growth, the research study showed that it actually, the belief is that it actually increased or accelerated the rate of tuition and fee growth. I've, I've seen that study. There's many studies, as, and as you know, uh, the people who do the studies have their own philosophical bent when they do them. But I would, I would say that it probably is a, a major factor. Uh, clearly, the last two, three years, um, uh, there has been you know, a, a stated policy to reduce the amount of money going into colleges and universities. But to be fair, I think that that's not that draconian. Uh, but the level of funding for colleges and universities during this period has been low. There was one point it was stable. There was one point where, you know, another chief executive uh, more or less made some uh, public statements about uh, his feelings for colleges and universities. So I think that that has something to do with it. When I look at page 20 in general, uh, clearly there's a lot of things that you have no control over. You don't have any control over, um, um, you know, national... Uh, economic uh, policies and conditions that affect you, clearly. But there's a lot of things on here that you do. And so I would say, um, what about your overall investment strategy? When we do uh, uh, evaluations and write bills for you know, other uh, departments, their investment strategy is extremely important in terms of you know, what are they going to do. And I would maintain that um, over the years, you know, you've had some, you've had a few issues with regard to your investment strategies. What would you, um, what would you say um, to that, and what might you do in the future uh, mm -hmm. to do a little bit better? Sure. So I, I'll start, and then I'll let Kent chime in as well. And obviously, it's well publicized that under prior management, there were some investments that were made that didn't pan out well. And Kent, I think, also referred a reference that. There was a shifting in the asset mix of the investments, you know, following the, the Great Recession that timing wise may not, while they may have been prudent things to do, timing wise was not a, necessarily a, a great thing. So one of the things that we do is we do look each year um, at our investment policy and the related asset allocation. And the goal really is to have a well diversified portfolio that maximizes the amount of return for the risk. So we work with a third-party investment consultant, Callan Associates. We uh, work through different asset allocation scenarios to try to maximize the re amount of return with the minimum amount of risk you know, in a prudent way. We relook at our investment portfolio and those asset allocations really annually to try to figure out what is the best mix going forward. And Kent, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that or? Well, we're we're not going to um, go to a, an asset allocation that uh, is kind of um, go for broke because uh, it's the, the opportunity or the chance of failure on that could really um, have negative ramifications for the required moral obligation for the state. So the previous administration that you allude to, did you feel that, uh, you know, looking back, that their um, asset allocation plan was a go for broke one. No, I don't mean to. I don't mean to insinuate that, but um, it's okay if you if you. No, I, but I actually I don't. The, <laughs> okay. The studies that were done after that showed the actual allocation was not uh, overall um, riskier than a general public plan. Um, the the allocation issues had to do with uh, money locked up, you know, and was not in public equities, which has been what has been rallying mm -hmm. in recent years. Uh, and then there were a couple of investment decisions where kind of the overall strategy, there's nothing wrong with private equity, it's just the ones that they got into kind of didn't work out. Um, and so um, I guess to kind of rephrase where I was, was heading with that is that in order to be better than everyone else, you have to be different and you have to be right. And in public, in, in public fund investing, if you're too much different, um, uh, I should say you have to be different, you have to be right, and you have to be able to hang on. And so in public fund investing, um, you could be different and right but when you go through an ebb, uh, the, the patience of its board of trustees, 
uh, the public to kind of see it through um, is always suspect. And so it ends up that you really, in a public fund, you can't be substantially different than what everyone else is doing. And you can hopefully manage the fund efficiently. So by trying to keep your costs down and uh, allocate hopefully a little bit better than others, you know, to, um, to be in the growth assets at the right time. So what I would hope to be uh, longer term is that we are third, excuse me, second quartile. So we're a little bit better than average over the long term. Okay. I'd say, too, even with a well-diversified investment portfolio, statistically, we should expect that about in three out of ten years, the portfolio goes down in value, that that's totally a perfectly normal expectation given what happens with stock market, bonds, et cetera. But statistically, you know, you can develop a model, you, you know yourself, yeah. that you can anticipate those things. Exactly. So we should expect that our you know, the value of the portfolio is going to fluctuate. That's totally a normal thing. When the value of the portfolio fluctuates, that also will impact the unfunded ratio of the plan as well. We can anticipate that it will happen. It's very difficult to anticipate when it will happen. Okay, but, you know, that's, that's what modeling is all about. And I, I would just, um, in general, uh, echo what uh, Representative Davis said. Big things give up things. We're a big state. So we've always exported a lot of things, our students and, you know, um, all kinds of things. So the whole thing about, you know, from businesses to students leaving the state in droves is, is overblown. Um, uh, they do do that, but again, that's something that, you know, you should be aware of and take in consideration, you know, with regard to your, uh, uh, to your investment models, I, I, would, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? All right. Thank you, um, gentlemen, both for testifying. Anything that, um, any additional information that was requested by anyone on the committee, we're going to make sure um, that everyone gets all the information. Catherine Grisovich from ISAC will be sharing with the entire committee um, answers to individual questions. Um, so thank you very much for providing that background for us. And um, I'm can't wait to see everybody tomorrow. So the Higher Education Appropriations Committee is uh, recessed to the call of the chair.